So here we have three things which have happened in chapter 38. Four things, really. Judah's son Ur dies. Judah's son Onan dies. Judah makes a promise which he doesn't keep to his daughter-in-law, Tamar. And then Judah's own wife dies in verse 12. Verse 12 says, Now after a considerable time, Shua, Shua's daughter, the wife of Judah, died. And when the time of mourning was ended, Judah went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira, the Adolamite. And Tamar, his daughter, was told in verse 13, Your father has gone down to shear the sheep. This is a big deal in a shepherd's community, that time of year when you go off and you shear all the sheep to get the wool to make the clothes. So verse 14 says, She, this is Tamar, this is his daughter-in-law, the widow of his son, she removed her widow's garments and... Uh, She disguised herself. She dressed up like a prostitute. And she took her place beside the road. I don't know how it is in Russia. I haven't lived in Russia for a long time. But in Hungary, when you go out in the country, it happens in the city too, mostly it happens in the country, there are prostitutes who stand along the road in certain places. And it's very obvious that that's their job. Well, in English, we say that this is the world's oldest profession. And so even then, there were prostitutes along the road. Well, this woman who is, was married to Judah's son and is now a widow disguises herself as a prostitute. And she takes her place um, along the road. And Judah has been widowed a very short time, a few days, a few weeks. He hasn't has... He hasn't had a wife, and it says in verse 15 um, that when he saw her, he stopped. And in verse 16, they, uh, they've got to make a bargain. He gets sex, but what is she going to get? What, did, what does she get uh, in return? He wants to give her a goat. He wants to give her an animal as payment for sex from the flock. And she says... Uh, no, I, I want something else. I want your personal seal, the thing that you use to show your, your identity. I also want your cord and, and your staff. This is all in verse 18. And so he was really desperate for a woman, so he gave all those things to her. And amazingly, she got pregnant. So... He goes away. She goes away. She changes her clothes. She takes off the clothes of a prostitute and she puts on the clothes of a widow. Then he gets the goat. He sends the goat to her and through his friend and they can't find her. So they ask around, where's the prostitute who used to to be here. We haven't seen any prostitute here. We don't know what you're talking about. And by the way, he thought it was a temple prostitute. So you see, it was not only lust, but it would have been false worship with a temple prostitute. So his friend comes back and says, I, could, I couldn't find her. Nobody could find her. And then he says, well, I guess I, guess I just lost the things that that I gave to her, um, and I guess they're just lost. Well, about three months later, his daughter-in-law starts to show she has what we call a baby bump, and it's obvious that she's going to have a baby. And so the father-in-law, Judah, who is the head of the household, uh, is informed that your daughter-in-law has been immoral because even though she doesn't have a husband, she, she is going to have a baby. So Judah says in verse 24, she has to be executed. 
let her come out and be burned. Now, this is a very interesting approach to justice. Um, obviously, two people had to sin. But the only person Judah is interested in, in punishing is the woman. It would actually be very convenient for Judah to punish the woman because then he wouldn't have to keep his promise to her. Then he wouldn't have to give one of his sons to her. So he says, well, she's sinned, let's, let's execute her. It also shows that we're very, we can be very, very severe in believing that the sins of other people should be punished. But we're pretty lenient when we think about our own sins. As you go through your life as a believer, let me encourage you to adopt this policy. Be hard on yourself. Be gracious and charitable with others. Be very strict and severe and unyielding when it comes to your own sins. But be as gracious and patient and kind and forgiving as you can be with the sins of others. Judah was just the opposite. And he said, well, she's got to die. So, when they bring her out, and um, when her father-in-law is about to pronounce sentence on her, she says, well, that's fine. You can kill me if you want to. There's just one thing you need to know, though. The father of the child is the owner of these things. And then she brings out Judah's seal, and she brings out Judah's cord, and she brings out Judah's staff. And she says, the owner of these things is the father of my child. Well, um, Judah disguised the death of Joseph, and he, dece he deceived his father. Tamar disguises her identity, and she deceives her father-in-law. Jacob had sex with a woman on his wedding night that he thought was somebody else. He thought it was Rachel, but it was Leah. Judah has sex with somebody after his wife dies, but he thinks it's somebody else. He thinks she's a temple prostitute, but it's not a temple prostitute. It's his daughter-in-law. Well, this is possible in a country where the face of the women is veiled and where they hide their identity. And so he had declared that the one who committed this sin deserves to die. And then he discovered that he was the one who committed that sin. And so his daughter-in-law was allowed to live. Now, we see two great things in this terrible, terrible story. It says in verse 26, when Judah saw that it was his property that she had, when Judah realized that he was the father and that he had sinned with his own daughter-in-law, he says, she is more righteous than I. It's my fault. Okay, that's the dawning of grace. When somebody realized that when someone realizes that they have sinned and they have said that someone deserves to die, but that person that they said deserved to die is more righteous than they are, that's grace. That's the dawning of grace. I think maybe Judah is also starting to understand there is somebody in control here, and it's not me. There's someone controlling our lives. There's someone controlling our destiny. There's someone in charge. I'm trying to determine what's going to happen. But I'm not, I'm not pulling it off. It's not working. 
It seems that I'm not able to control what happens, which means that somebody else is controlling what will happen. That's grace. But let me tell you something else. There's a much greater grace going on here. As a matter of fact, there's the greatest grace going on here. I wonder if you know who is the first woman ever mentioned in the New Testament. Do you know the name of the first woman who's ever mentioned in the New Testament? Turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1, verse 2. In the second verse of the New Testament, we find the name of a woman. That woman's name is Tamar. Now, here's what God's sovereignty means. First of all, God's sovereignty means that He can do anything He wants to do. Second, God's sovereignty means that He can do things that we can't do. Thirdly, God's sovereignty means that He can do things which shock us. But God's sovereignty does not shock us with God's severity. God's sovereignty shocks us with God's mercy. The thing that's hard about God is not how how full of wrath and punishment He is. The thing that's shocking about God is how full of love and mercy He is. Remember I told you this saying that God can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. God can take something that's bad and make it, make something good happen. Well, acting like a prostitute is pretty bad. Um, Having sex with your father-in-law is pretty bad. That's pretty bad. So what happens because of those bad things? Christ is born. Christ is brought into the world through an act of prostitution. Think about that. Now, the professors tell us that these stories are made up. You think this story is made up? Why would they make the story up? The story is horrible. The story is embarrassing. Judah is the patriarch of the kings. The kings come from Judah. David came from the tribe of Judah. They believed that the Messiah would come from the line of Judah. You think this is made up? You think they made up a story to humiliate their kings? No, no, no. The story is not made up. The story really happened. So you see, something terrible, something embarrassing, the stories of sexual immorality become the story of something wonderful, the story of God's grace in the world, the story of the way that Christ would be born. This book is supernatural. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the Kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com. 
Well, we can see why Genesis 38 is a chapter that most people would not be eager to teach on. But that's, that's a shame because Genesis 38 is full of very, very important things, things that we would do well to learn and understand. Joseph was so righteous that his unrighteous brothers wanted to kill him. The sons of Judah were so unrighteous that God had to kill them. Uh, one of the greatest symptoms of wickedness is you blame the righteous and you excuse the guilty. It is one feature of wickedness, one symptom of wickedness, that the wicked person has a tendency to excuse wickedness and guilt and blame righteousness. We see this in Judah's life. As a matter of fact, it says that um, the reason he didn't keep his promise to Tamar is that he actually blamed Tamar for the death of, of his son. He lost two sons. Um, chapter 38, verse 11 says, Judah said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought, I'm afraid that he too may die like his brothers. So Tamar went and lived in her father's house. You see, he didn't blame his wicked sons for their own death. He thought it was just bad luck, or he thought that maybe this woman was bringing bad luck to his house since her husband, and she was married to Ur, not Onan. We're never told exactly whether Onan was married or not, but she's the widow of, of Ur. Um, he thinks she's bringing some sort of bad luck to the family. And so we're told this story of Judah's own guilt and the way that Tamar was able to deceive her husband, in, or, or her father-in-law. In fact, when she got pregnant, she had twins. Evidently, twins ran in the family. Jacob was a twin. And now he's given twin grandsons, Judah being the father and Tamar being the mother. Um, and there was some question about which son was, was born first. And so they tied a, a red string around the hand of the brother who was born first. Verse 29 said, as, as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. So he is named Perez. And afterward, his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and he was named Zerah. We're told that what happened during this birth was impossible, that twins actually cannot be born this way. Let me just say that uh, maybe it was impossible, but the whole thing is supernatural. God is at work. God is showing signs, portents, wonders, because it is through this birth that God will bring the Messiah into the world. And He's calling the attention to the birth of these twins by special and maybe even impossible things.